about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Pillivant of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will say to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. Shall we open up our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, picking up where we left off last time. The... The men, and I think there was a a lady or two even, who the Lord used to pen scripture, they all wrote the original books of the Bible, all 66 of them, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is inerrant, infallible, it is the perfect word of God. Now when they wrote their letters, they didn't write it with chapter and verse divisions. They didn't say, you know, John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, verse 2, He was in the beginning with God, and, and on, on, and on. Those chapter and verse divisions were added later so that you and I could more easily and more readily reference certain passages. We'll call them addresses. You know, if you say, go find uh, the Pillivant's home in Bartlett, then uh, that would be kind of difficult to do. You'd be wandering around Bartlett for some time. Now, if I told you my address, which if if, if you're you're, you're a nice person, I'll tell you later, Uh, but but if I tell you my address, then you'd be able to Google it or MapQuest it and be able to find it the first time. Well, the addresses of the Bible are the chapter and verse divisions. The, The Bible was divided in chapters... In the year 1228 A.D., you know, almost uh, 1,200 years after or 1,100 years after the last book of the Bible had been written, it was divided into chapters. The Old Testament was divided into verses in 1448 A.D. The New Testament was divided into verses in 1551 A.D. So in 1551, finally they had the entire Bible, which was infallible, inerrant, and, and all that stuff, divided it into chapters and verses. Now, the Bible itself, the original letters and all, the, the, the 66 books of the Bible are inerrant, divinely inspired. However, the chapter and verse divisions are not divinely inspired. They're helpful, but sometimes they interrupt a thought that hasn't yet been concluded. And here, I'm, I'm making a big deal of this because this is such the case here in John chapter 10. The verse and chapter dividers didn't do a particularly good job in dividing chapter 9 and chapter 10 because chapter 9 ends with Jesus still talking to a crowd. He's in the middle of his teaching. He wasn't yet done. And if you study chapter 10 without the background of chapter 9, then ultimately you're going to miss the big picture. So in order to understand what Jesus is here said in chapter 10, we need to study it in the context of what he has already said in chapter 9. As you remember from last week, in chapter 9, Jesus had given sight to a man who was born blind. He was at least 30 years of age at that time. And, and from birth until then, he could not see, but then Jesus... In his, in his way, he made 
uh, clay out of his spit. He anointed the guy's eyes, sent him to the pool of Siloam. The guy went and washed. He came back seeing. But he had healed the man on the Sabbath day. Therefore, the religious rulers were really, really mad at Jesus. They brought the blind man, or the man who formerly had been blind, they brought him in and began to question him. Then they began to question that man's parents. And then they brought the, 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 the man back in, the formerly blind man, and what they wanted to do was to get them to confess that Jesus wasn't from God. Their heart in questioning these people is, hey, hey, deny that Jesus is from God. We don't believe that he's of God. Yeah, he healed you or whatever, and, 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 but yet we want you to proclaim to everybody that Jesus isn't from God. Well, that formerly blind man had had, had enough of these guys not seeing clearly the hand of God in what Jesus had done. He boldly and convincingly defended Jesus as truly coming from God. Notice chapter 9, verse 32. The man, speaking to these religious guys, said, Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. This is a brand new, unique thing that has happened. A miraculous thing. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Very good point. An airtight, solid defense of Jesus. Well, the religious rulers couldn't match the man's wisdom, so they began to attack the man himself. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. They excommunicated him from not just religion, but from the whole of society. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Lord, who is he that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, now, now here is where Jesus begins his discussion, his dissertation, his teaching to the people that continues through to chapter 10. So already Jesus has established that he is from God because he's the only one who's able to give sight to him who was born blind. He also confessed that he is the son of God, the one and only begotten son of God. So in this context, this theme that Jesus is the only one, he continues to reveal more about the fact that he is the only one. Jesus gives spiritual sight. Notice uh, Jesus said to him, in verse 39, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see. So there are a group of people who don't see, and Jesus says, I'm going to give them sight, and that those who see another group who thinks they see may be made blind. So those who don't see, Jesus has come to give sight. But those who think they see, he's going to just in, in increase their blindness. See, Jesus gives spiritual sight to those who know that apart from him, they are spiritually blind. Those who recognize their spiritual blindness, I don't know where I'm headed, I don't know where I'm going, who am I, what am I, where am I? All those big questions of life. When they come to Jesus, he takes away the blinders. They get it. I remember when I received the Lord when I was 15, beforehand, I didn't have a clue. Afterward, I didn't much have a clue, but at least I understood that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the only way of salvation. And I've never changed my opinion since that day until now. So he gives sight to those who recognize their spiritual blindness. But those who think that they have spiritual insight, worldly wisdom, but apart from Jesus. I don't know Jesus because I see clearly the way things are. And they have their philosophies of life and they... They think they know where they're headed because they're good people and all. Hey, those people who think they have sight are truly spiritually blind. You know, some of the Pharisees who were with Jesus listening to him at that time, they, they understood that Jesus was directing these comments toward them. Some of the Pharisees, verse 40, who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? They realized that Jesus was accusing them of being spiritually blind. And in verse 41, Jesus said, If you were blind... You recognize that you were blind, you would have no sin. Not only would you be able to see, but your sin would be taken away. But now you say, we see. We don't need you. We see clearly. 
Therefore, your sin remains. According to Jesus, they were truly blind because they thought they had spiritual insight apart from him. And because of that, their sin still remained. And they were spiritually not just blind, but they were spiritually dead. Again, Jesus' main point here is that he's the only one who can not only give sight to a man who was born blind, but give spiritual sight to those who recognize their spiritual blindness. We're all like the man who was born blind. We're all born sinners. Contrary to popular philosophy and pop psychology, we're not all born good, little, innocent, wonderful children who through you know, our bad parenting later on grew up to be bad people. No, we're all born bad. You know, it's funny. You don't have to teach your children how to lie. They come about that quite naturally, don't they? You tell them, don't take any cookies. Let them, you know, it's going to be dinner time. Leave those cookies cooling there on the countertop. You turn your back, you come around, they have chocolate all over their face. And you say, did you eat those cookies that I told you not to take? And what do they say? No. Bunch of liars is what they are. Just flat out, ball face liars. Then why do you have all these chocolate on your face then if you didn't eat them? Well, I just, I, I, I smelled them. You know, I, 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 my kids, I love my kids, and I have this wonderful story that I could tell, but my kids threaten me that the next time I use them as an example, they're going to divorce me, so I, I can't even say it, but it's such a cool story. And Anyway, we don't have to teach our kids to lie. We have to teach them to tell the truth, because we're all born sinners. That's why Jesus said, in order to go to heaven, you must be born again. That's right. Because first birth, don't cut it. We're all born going to hell. That's why we need to be born again. Jesus said, except a man be born again, they won't even see the kingdom of heaven. So the big point here Jesus is making is I'm the only one. The only one who can heal a blind guy who is born blind. The only one that can give spiritual sight to those who are spiritually blind. I'm the only one. And now in chapter 10, Jesus continues this only one theme with calling himself the one true shepherd, and also the one true door of salvation. Verse 1, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. There's only one way into a sheepfold, and a sheepfold was basically four walls piled high, high enough to keep predators out, with only one doorway in. And it was very common for shepherds, several shepherds at nighttime, to bring their flocks together in the one fold. But they all had to go in and out of that one and only doorway. If someone tries to get in some other way, the same as a wolf, a thief, a robber. And that's the point Jesus is making. There's only one right way, only one right way in the sheepfold. Verse 2, but he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd enters by the door because he has a right to his sheep. Verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens. There'd be a man, make sure that only the right people were allowed in and out. The doorkeeper opens. The sheep hear his, the the shepherds, their shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Even today, in the Middle East and elsewhere, they have these sheepfolds. And again, shepherds bring in their different flocks at night. But then in the morning, each shepherd will stand at the door of the sheepfold and begin to call out his own sheep by name. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because those sheep will hear their shepherd's voice. The other sheep that don't belong to him will hear his voice as well, but they don't recognize it. It's not their shepherd. And so the sheep will one by one come out to that shepherd. And then he leads them away. It's a fascinating thing to see. Now, was Jesus just giving some folksy colloquialism that the people were common, uh, was common knowledge of people anyway? 
No. Notice in verse 6, Jesus used this illustration. He's trying to illustrate something, like a parable. He spoke in many parables. You know what a parable is? It's two big male cows tied together. Parables? No. A parable, a, a parable is a story of, of a common occurrence, something that everybody knew about, but yet Jesus used it in a way to teach some underlying spiritual truth. Well, here he's using this as a parable, as an illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. So, in verse 7, Jesus begins to explain what he meant by proclaiming, first of all, that he is the door, the one and only door that the sheep are supposed to enter into. Verse 7, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He claims to be the, the one and only. That, that, that his sheep, which we know we are the sheep of his hand, Christians, people who have embraced Jesus as their Savior and Lord, he is the only one true door. We come to salvation through him and him alone. By grace we have been saved through faith, but that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we're saved. But it's not through Buddha, it's not through Vishnu, it's not through any other religious system. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, he's telling the truth or he's lying. But when you come across people who say, I believe that Jesus is a great moral teacher, they don't have a clue as to what he said. Because you can't make a statement like, I'm the only way to heaven, and then just be passed off as a, a good moral teacher or a great man. Either he's a liar, or maybe he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. You see what he's doing here? He is preventing humanity from keeping a neutral stance with him. You cannot be neutral. You cannot be a Switzerland sort of a person. You know, just go oh, very neutral. We will not get involved. You cannot be like that. He's either lying or he's a lunatic or he is truly the Lord. And if he is the Lord, you and I, all of us, will answer to him. And if you want to go to heaven, and let me tell you the truth, the alternative is not desirable. If you desire to go to heaven, then Jesus says he is the one and only door. Thank you. <laughs> I agree. Amen. Now, what are you going to do with that? What will you do with that knowledge? Is he or isn't he? You decide by whether or not you surrender your life to him. I am the only door. He said, now there are others paraded themselves as Christ, but they weren't. Notice in verse 8. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep, the true Christians, they did not hear them. You know, there were many false Christs who came before Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. And you know what? There are many others since Jesus who have also claimed to be Messiahs or Christs. Or One man on religious television said, God revealed to me that I'm as much of an incarnation of God as Jesus Christ is. As a blasphemous, heretical thing for a person to say. There's only one only begotten son, and it certainly isn't Kenneth Copeland, the man who said that. And so, um, Jesus claims to be the one and only. All others are thieves and robbers. You know, they parade themselves as spiritual men and women. But you know what they do? They prey upon the sheep. That's the difference between the true Christ and the false Christs. Because the true Christ gives his life for the sheep. The false Christ wants to slaughter a bunch of sheep so that he can benefit and live in luxury. Or she can benefit and live in luxury. Well, Jesus' sheep don't follow them. They don't sit down in front of the TV and subject themselves to that false garbage, that false doctrine that they promote, that they perpetrate upon the naive body of Christ. You wonder, why do people listen to them? And I, I, I think it boils down to this. People just aren't reading their Bibles. 
and so they don't know the truth. They, they barely know a little bit about the scripture and then they see these guys twisting the scripture. They're not reading it in context. They're pulling things out that aren't even there and they focus on one word and, and they build a whole big doctrine around it and as a result, you're writing out a check and sending them your money so that they can fly around in their fancy jets and drive their fancy cars and live in their, their fancy homes and all that, living lives of luxury. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. The true sheep don't follow them. They follow Jesus, the one who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says in verse 9, I am the door. There's only one door. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Hey, maybe today you haven't yet entered into Jesus. Oh, maybe you were you know, born in America and therefore by virtue of your American Christian heritage, you might think, oh, I'm fine, right? No. You need Jesus. You need to embrace him and believe in him. And if you haven't yet done so, why not today? Why not take him up on his word, the one who not only claimed to be the only way, but rose from the dead to prove the point? Why not today receive him? I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Again, he's the only way into salvation. And according to him, any way that is not through him is the way of thieves who desire to steal, kill, and destroy the sheep. Well, in verses 11 through 18, Jesus claims to not only be the only door, but also claims to himself be the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know how Jesus proves that he is good to us? By giving his life for us. What proves that God loves us? Have you ever thought, gee, God, do you love me? Hey, you only need to look at one thing, and that's the bloodstained cross of Jesus Christ. And that proves, that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you. In Romans chapter 5, we read, When we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I I admit that before I came to faith in Jesus, I was ungodly, without God. I was a religious young boy. I had gone through my catechism classes. I had performed several sacraments. And according to the church I was raised in, I was well on my way to spending very little time in purgatory that I might eventually go to heaven. And that's what they told me. But yet I was still ungodly. I had no God in me. Because I didn't yet embrace Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. And ask yourself, who would you be willing to die for? If it boiled down between you or them, who would you be willing to take a bullet for? Who would you be willing to go to the electric chair for? Probably a very short list if you're honest. A very, very short list if you're honest. Maybe your immediate family. Maybe your extended family. But then, you know, there's there's a lot on, uh, not many more on that list, are there? Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, when? When did Jesus die for us? When we got our acts together? When we got good? No, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice the goodness of God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus sacrificed himself for his sheep. That's how we know that he is good. The false prophets, the false teachers, they don't sacrifice himself for the sheep. They sacrifice the sheep for themselves. That's how we can tell they're false prophets. And also those false prophets, those false shepherds, when the going gets tough, they get going. They get going far away from the problem. They run as fast as they can away from the situation. Why? Because they're not true shepherds after God's hearts. God's heart, they're hirelings. Notice verse 12. A hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. 
The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. The word hireling is a dirty word among ministers. I'll tell you, you do not want to be a hireling. A hireling is somebody who's just hired to do a job, but he himself has no vested interest in what he's overseeing, in what he is, the sheep that he's over. He views the sheep as just a way for him to make a buck. When the first sign of danger arises, the hireling, he goes off. There's a story about a minister who was pastoring a decent-sized church. And he got a phone call from another city, the same uh, type of group. Uh, and the church was bigger than his, more people, and a little higher salary. And they said, look, we'd like you to come to our church and, and be our minister, be our pastor. And so he went home and he said to his wife, hey, uh, the, the church in the next town that's bigger than ours, it has a little better salary, they're offering me this job. And the wife says, okay, well, let's, let's kneel down and pray about it. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I'll pray about it, but you go start packing. You see, he's a hireling. And the grass is a little greener on the other side. He's out of there. If problems arise, man, I just wish I could leave. And I'm sick of these sheep and, you know. He bails on him. That's a hireling. I don't want to be that. I want to be like Jesus. First, I want to be a good sheep who doesn't give him any trouble. <laughs> but then I want to be a shepherd after his heart who hangs in there regardless. I want to be like Jesus. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. You know, if there's any question in your mind right now whether or not you truly belong to God, that question mark reveals you don't. I don't want to be rude or obnoxious or in your face. or. But yet again, I don't want to pull punches. If there's any doubt, it means that really you're not because Jesus here says, I am known by my own. His sheep know that they're his sheep. There's no question about it. So if there's any question, let's resolve the question this morning. After the closing song or during the closing song, you come forward. There will be people here that would love to pray with you that you might make sure that, that you know, that you know, that you know that you belong to him. And when you die, you're going to heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am known by my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see that there in verse 15, the first part of that, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Here Jesus is again declaring to us, that his relationship with the Father is different from our relationship with him. Different from our relationship with the Father. We, by virtue of receiving him as Savior and Lord, become adopted sons and daughters. But Jesus is the eternal, only begotten Son of God. And has intimate knowledge with the Father that we on this side of eternity, or eternity can, can never ever understand or grasp. And then again, notice at the end of verse 15 how Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now he came primarily to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But in just a second here, he's going to say how he has also laid down his life for another breed of sheep, the Gentile sheep. Notice in verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So here Jesus is indicating that he has other sheep that were not of that fold. And again, the original fold was the house of Israel. Jesus said in Matthew 15, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Later on, however, the door of salvation was opened up to the Gentiles. And then the church, uh, several churches arose. Paul uh, ministered to the church of Ephesus, a Gentile church, church of, church of non-Jewish believers in Jesus Christ, and he told them that the Gentiles were the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy here of sheep of another fold. In Ephesians 2, verse 11, he says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made by human hands, you, you're, you're Gentiles, the Jews call you Gentiles, that at that time you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and having no hope. 
You're without God in the world. Before Jesus, you were without hope. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the Gentiles now brought into a relationship with God, the two, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, now together in one fold. You see that there? Now, the reason I labor that point is because the Mormon church teaches that Jesus, when he said, I have sheep of another fold, what he meant was the Native American Indians. And they call them the lost tribe of the Lamanites. And basically what they teach is that after Jesus rose from the dead and after he ascended into heaven, he came back down and went to North America. And he began to teach the Native American Indians about faith in him and about revival and all. And he did this before the the English pilgrims came to America. But what's fascinating is there's no American Indian tribe who has any record of Jesus coming to them. There's no archaeology at all that shows that Jesus ever came to them. There were no Christian believers when the first English settlers came. In fact, the pilgrims, it's been purported in some of the secular history books that the pilgrims came here primarily to escape religious persecution in Europe. You know what? That's not exactly true oh they were persecuted but you know why the pilgrims really came over here if you read their writings it's clear they came to evangelize the unreached native american indians they saw themselves not as as fugitives and and refugees they saw themselves as missionaries and they came to preach the gospel to these people why because the gospel hadn't been preached by anybody, and certainly not by Jesus. So the Bible is clear. The two houses or the two sheep are are the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers, not the, 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 the early church and the Native American Indians. The Native American Indians are included in the Gentiles, but Jesus never went to them. So anyway, moving along. In verse 17, Jesus again reiterates his special relationship with the Father. Therefore, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. See, Jesus was obedient to the father, even unto the point of laying down his own life for us. That's obedience. Son, I want you to kill yourself so that others can live. I want you to willingly lay yourself into the hand of these people in order that others may live. And Jesus did it. But notice he says in verse 18, no one takes it from me. Jesus is making it clear that he and he alone has the power over his own life and death and his own resurrection. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. So all that Jesus has been saying up to this point, he's the only one who can give sight to the blind. He's the only one who can cause the spiritually blind to see. He's the one and only door of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. All of this is backed up by his claim that he would lay down his life and that he would raise it up again. See, a person can make these statements, but how are they going to prove it? Jesus proved it by laying down his life and three days later, rising from the dead. Now, his statement demands a response from each one of us. We cannot be neutral. Is he the only one who can give sight to the spiritually blind? Is he the one only doorway of salvation? Is he the good shepherd? Did he die on the cross and three days later rise from the dead? If so, what are you going to do with him? He said, he who believes in me has life. He who does not believe in me shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's what he said. What will we do with that? You know, as it is today, so it was in Jesus' day when 
when people really consider what he said, there are great divisions that occur. Some people embrace him and say, yes, he is. Others want nothing to do with him. They're angry at him and his message. Notice the people's reaction in verses 19 through 21. Therefore, there was division again among the Jews because of these sayings. Many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Don't listen to that stuff. He's crazy. But others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. And can a demon open the eyes of a blind? Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? That's a good question, isn't it? Can a demon-possessed person perform miracles? And again, what about Jesus? Was he lying? Was he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? You decide by whether or not you give him your life. And again, if you haven't yet surrendered your life to him, this morning would be a great day to do so. Wonderful day to invite him to be your Savior and Lord during the closing song. As we sing the song, if you feel that you need to get right with the Lord, you need Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, you recognize now he's the only way. It's not going to be through your good works, but you recognize that he's the only way. Then you get up from where you are and you come forward. Nor is there salvation in any other, we read in the book of Acts. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus will save you if you come to him. Now, what if you're a believer and you're like, okay, John, I already already know that stuff. I believe that Jesus is the only way. Then let me challenge you with this. Are you finding the fulfillment of your life in him? And in his word? Or as the old song goes, are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Just ask yourself this question. Am I content? Do I, am, I, am I really content with how God is running my life? Now maybe you made a mess of things and you're dealing with some of the circumstances. But, but all in all, are you, are you content with Jesus? Or maybe you've been looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in things of this world. You know, if you do that, I know myself, if I look for my fulfillment and satisfaction in the world, I'm empty. I'm always left miserable. It's like watching a a football game or a basketball game or a baseball game and it it comes to an end and and it was fun and it was exciting and, and I love sports. Don't get me, I love sports. Love to play them. I used to be good at one time. And uh, kind of at least, in my own mind, in my own hall of shame, I was, thought it was good. But yet, today, after it's all said and done, I, I watch a game and, and I still feel kind of hollow. It's like, that's it? Isn't there more? If you're trying to find your fulfillment in things of this world, you will wind up hollow, empty. Because you were designed to be filled with the things of God. You were designed to give God, glory, and pleasure. And so this morning, if you feel that you've been looking for love in all the wrong places, just remember Jesus is the only way. Not just the way in, but the way of. He's the way of our lives. From new birth unto our brand new beginning in heaven. All throughout, Jesus is the only way that leads to life, eternal life and abundant life here and now. So, maybe you'd like somebody to pray with. You're a believer, but yet you just want to rededicate yourself to finding your life in Jesus. If that's you, then you come forward during the closing song too, and people will be here to pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the grace that you've given to us. Lord, you give us this wonderful opportunity to come into your presence, to study your word, to grow, to be built up in our faith. And Lord Jesus, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And Lord, for any here today that are not right with you, whether they're still on the outside looking in or whether they've come in and out and yet just are are, are wandering a bit, Lord, as as wayward sheep, Lord, we pray that we would all come to the, the single faith, the single unity in you Lord, that you and you alone would be our life. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and mercy, your love toward us. Help us to take you up on it. In your name we pray. Amen.
We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the date of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m., Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.